In this video, our SAP Analytics Cloud product experts will demonstrate the main features of our new release. Feel free to jump straight to the features you're interested in by using the timestamps in the description below. Let's dive in and hear from our SAP Analytics Cloud product experts. Customers now have the ability to deactivate and reactivate users in the system. When a user is deactivated, they can no longer access the system and they do not consume a license, but their content is retained and the users can be reactivated at any time. Now under security users area, when I highlight a user, I have a new option to deactivate or reactivate the user. If I choose to deactivate a user, I'll give it a message. I can email those users to notify them that that has been deactivated. When I deactivate, the user is now shown as being deactivated in the system. Their content remains and I can reactivate them at any time with the activate user button. Reactivate the user. Customers no longer need to log a ticket to enable CMEK, Customer Managed Encryption Keys in SAP Analytics Cloud. The setup of this has now been automated. Administrators can now configure the integration between their SAP Analytics Cloud Private Edition Tenant and their SAP Data Custodian Key Management Service to enable Customer Managed Encryption Keys. They can also enable a secondary key for disaster recovery purposes. And at any time, they can disable the integration uh, between SAP Analytics Cloud and SAP Data Custodian to stop using customer managed encryption keys. There is also a new permission and role within the system so that system owners can only allow key administrators or administrators that they desire to control this functionality to be able to do so. So now within SAP Analytics Cloud under the system administration and external systems, there is now a new area for bring your own key for customer managed encryption keys in here. When you hit the setup primary key, you would enter the information from your data custodian key management service. So the tenant name and then the associated details. When you then activate the key, bring your own key will be activated for this tenant. You can also then set up a secondary key or disable a key at any time. Hi, I'm Ali, a product manager for SAP Analytics Cloud, and I'll be walking you through this demo today. We are introducing a new feature that displays specific page titles for SAP Analytics Cloud, denoting the module and the name of the object, if any. It will appear on the browser tab, browser history, and the dropdown for open tabs. Here, we're in the stories module, which is reflected in the page title and we'll click on a story. Now we can see the name of the story is also reflected in the page title. As mentioned, the specific page title can be seen in history and in the dropdown for open tabs as well. Since each page title is unique, users will know which tabs are open without having to click on the tabs. That wraps up our demo. Thanks for tuning in. With the Q2 release, the query analysis feature will be extended to widget analysis for an even better guided design experience. Important best practice information will be provided to the content designers and developers already during the design phase of the widgets. 
The Performance Analysis Report can be accessed from the Widgets context menu, Show Performance Statistics. This report is divided into general and planning related recommendations. It provides information of the data source that's being used by the widget, the connection name as well as the system type. The widget's end-to-end -end runtime is split up into front-end, network and back-end time, which allows you to identify the most time-consuming layer and directly access the best practices documentation for further analysis. Performance recommendations are categorized into high and medium impact recommendations. The planning performance section will be available if planning versions are used in the widget. Besides high and medium impact recommendations, information about the version size and the version names are given here. The SAP Analytics Cloud content will be updated. The story, private version statistics and analysis will be updated. It contains more information to analyze version sizes, to monitor resource usage, to assist you with housekeeping tasks and to detect planning cycles. The content can be accessed via the side menu of SAC under System, Performance and then Private Version Statistics and Analysis. The first page contains KPIs about the current version sizes, the growth of unpublished versions as well as insights into top 10 versions and their owners. The second page provides a time series of number of versions and their version sizes, as well as the top 10 versions and details of actions and action steps. This helps to understand how the version size came about. The second SRC content update is a name change of the formerly known administration cockpit, which is being renamed now to System Overview. The system overview helps the administrators or project leads to get system information fast, to do an authorization review, gather usage information and identify housekeeping potential. The system overview can be accessed via the side menu of SAC, either via the old monitor, where you get a pop-up with additional information that this will be replaced by the system overview or directly via the system overview. The third SSC content update is about the usage statistics part in the system overview. The new usage statistics information helps to make data-driven decisions and to optimize system performance by tracking the adoption progress and the usage of the content within the story itself, such as visited pages and most frequently rendered widgets. It can be accessed via the system overview under the Usage tab. We provide KPIs that contrast deployed content and used content. We help to track project adoption progress, including project license usage. The story usage provides top 10 used stories information and insights into actual story usage. What are the most frequently visited pages, on which page and which widget happen the most actions, etc. Hello, my name is Jaden. I am Product Manager for SAP Analytics Cloud. I'm happy to announce that the optimized story experience that unifies a story and analytic application is now in general availability with QRC2 release. With this release, you will have a unified artifact for both the story and the analytic app, and we provide you an integrated design time for both the story designer and the developer. And you will find a unified story module page and the landing page and also enhance the custom widget with data binding capability. You will be able to leverage the theme and the CSS capability to define the theme and CSS once and reuse in multiple stories. 
and we also provide advanced responsive layout so that you will be able to define your story once but has optimized the layout for different desktop resolutions and the mobile devices. And you can use the data change insight capability to proactively inform the, about the most important data change in your story. We also provide unified bookmark workflows that you will be able to bookmark all the entire widget state in your story. In addition, we have the vertical field panel that end user can switch between vertical and horizontal in design time and runtime. And we provide linked widgets diagram that you can have a central place to view and manage your linked analysis. In addition, from the story, you can navigate to the data analyzer for the further data exploration scenario. And in addition, we have the configurable runtime toolbar. And also, you can also configure the widget context menu. And all of these stories um, can be support scheduling and also can be run on the mobile devices. And now I will show you all these feature highlights in a demo. Here, I would like to introduce the Unified Story capability. Unified Story is the further development of the optimized story experience. With the QRC Q2 releases, we are going to general availability for this feature for the QRC tenants. So it means once the QRC Q2 release is deployed on your tenant. Now, if you are creating a story on the optimized design experience, it will contain the story and analytical app integration. So let's have a look into it. We go to the story module, and then now we would like to create a responsive story. The default set is already the optimized design experience. With the QRCQ2 releases, this optimized design experience will contain the integration of the story and the analytical application. Now you see that design time, you already see on the left side that the left panel is opened. I can use this icon to open or close the left panel. In the left panel, we see the asset area. Here is all the widgets that you can use to create your story. We see that a custom widget is available. We see and also different container is available. And uh, we have the outline um, view and that you will be able to see that the widgets that are already included in your story. Currently, we create a responsive page and uh, um, including a grid link here. And then we have the third option is a filter. And here we will be able to see the filter that already set in the design time all in this filter area. Now let's go to the asset area mm -hmm. and uh, I, we can now drag and drop the widgets into the canvas. So here I see I have drag and drop one panel and also two panel within a responsive lane. I am able to now within the responsive lane and to overlap the widgets. So that is the improved behavior in the unified story comparing to the classic story. And that we overcome that limit that you will be able to overlap the widgets as you want also in the responsive lane and uh, that you will cover a lot of scenarios. For example, you will overlap chart and table. You want to overlap the chart with some image behind or shape behind. Now with unified story, that is possible. And in the um, integrated here toolbar, you see the view trap to the left panel and you also see the right panel. The right panel is basically the um, build and the styling panel and uh, as you already know from the classic story. But now you need to trigger this part with the right panel click here. And you may also see this new button and with this new button, you will be able to switch from the standard mode to advanced mode. We have the integrated design time within the integrated design time story designer work with the standard mode story developer work with the advanced mode but we can also enable the switch from the standard mode to the advanced mode so in my role i am a story developer so my default mode is advanced mode that is why you see the different containers and uh, you see more the field controls in the outline you see actually i have the scripting capabilities and also i can add all the scripting stuff 
that is because I am in the advanced mode. Now I can also switch to the standard mode. With the standard mode that um, the story designer will not be able to use the whole scripting stuff. And also in the asset panel, you see it's only the panel they can use and so on. So here we want to give the story designer a clean and easy environment for them to create the ad hoc stories. And or we will, if the, they want to leverage more advanced capabilities like a scripting or more advanced container or widgets, and they can switch to the advanced mode, then more widgets will be appear in the asset panel and in the outline panel, the scripting part is appear. So with this approach, and we will enable different user groups to work all within the same uh, design, integrated design time, but have their environment to work with. Okay, now and uh, let's move into an already predefined story. So here you see a predefined story, and here is a toolbar. You see the left panel I already mentioned before. You also see the right panel. Within this um, story, I think you see actually this Zen key chart. Zen key chart is a custom widget, so we can integrate a custom widget already in the unified story. So if I open the right panel, we will be able to see how this Zenki chart is configured. Go to the build panel, and using this build panel, we only need to define the data model for the Zenki chart, select a measure, select a dimension, also maybe define some filter, then you have already configured this Zenki chart in your story. So here again, no coding knowledge is required to consume or to integrate it as a custom widget into your story. How you define a configure a chart, that is how you define and configure your custom widget. It's very easy and convenient to use. Besides the custom widget, we also have the capability, SIEM capability. SIEM is a SAC central artifact. You can define a SIEM save in the file repository and then uh, in this um, story designer in this drop down boxes only per one click and then can already change the look and feel of the entire story so here for example i just change it to the dark scene then you see per one click i change the entire look and feel of my story and or if I want to edit the scene, I just go to here using the edit button and to see how this scene is defined. We will be able to see that how the button is defined here. You see exactly in the preview under your definition of your particular scene. For example, how is a canvas? We see now we define the black as background is a canvas. And or you can go through all of your different widgets to define it and using the preview to see how it looks like. And or if this um, configuration is not sufficient, you will be able to leverage the CSS capability like here and then to um, basically more enhance the same capability with the CSS and then uh, save this entire settings as a scene in file repository. And then in the drop down boxes, you have the option per one click to uh, change the look and feel. So I can also go back to the live scene again. So scene is an enterprise capability. So now you can create your company central scene and then every story designer developer can leverage the scene and you can ensure all the stories created in your company has the same and the look and feel and look consistent. And the other um, new area for the unified story is the responsive layout I mentioned before. And let's have a look into the responsive layout I mentioned before that we can overlap the widgets. So here we have a Zenki chart and I have a scripting capabilities using a toggle to switch chart and a table visibility. So now we can see, um, now the table is hidden in the design time. I can make that visible. You see that the table is really overlapping with this, um, with this uh, Zenki chart. So I can hidden again because in the runtime, I will use the scripting to switch the visibility between this Zenki chart and also the table. 
and also this um, big improvement for the advanced responsive layout is that in the design time i already have the device preview i can already see how this story will look like for the different device type so here we see have the in the desktop and then we have a look into at the um, laptop and also here you also can see in my outline right and my entire responsive story is based on the different lane let's have a look into here in the header lane how it is configured let's have a look into on the right side go to the build panel we provide a responsive layout and also responsive rule configuration for each devices and uh, for the uh, laptop devices, we see actually the responsive rule on the right side configured. And then let's have a look into the large tablet. As I mentioned before, and these rules, you don't need to create each rule for each devices. And this rule is automatically cascading down. In my example here means in the large tablet, I don't define the specific rule, means it will automatically cascading from the last rule. The last rule is a laptop. And that means you actually don't need to define every rule for every devices. We have the cascading capabilities for this responsive rule. Now we have looked into how it looks like on the large tablet. Now have looked into what's looking to the small tablet. In the small tablet, we here do need to define a specific rules because the um, space is uh, getting smaller and uh, we want to display this header best around this text area in the 100% of the width. So here I define the responsive rule. This lane should now get the rule of the auto flow. And the auto flow should be based on the row. So you can select based on the row or based on the column. And with that, we can also select what is the width uh, of this um, particular widget. The head widget should be 100% of the width, and this is a 4 KPI tile, and it should occupy 25% of the width. And uh, then you have also the option to hide some widget for this particular lane for the small tablet. So now let's go to have a look into the large phone. So first on the large phone, so every widget is occupy 100%. So that is already the default rule that you don't need to specifically to define it. That is defined already for you. But here we do expect some specific um, behavior here. So first, under look at this responsive rules. For the large phone, of course, that should be auto flow. And we select the auto flow should be column wise. In addition, this auto flow, because uh, we have a look into this then key chart and also a table behind and also the show table this area. And with auto flow, that we can also exclude some widgets out, outside of the auto flow. For example, we have excluded the table behind the chart and also this switch area. These two widgets should be excluded from the auto flow because we want them to stay in a certain position. So for example, the shown the table's height should be 17 grid on the top and the table should be 18 grid. So with that, we will be able to manage to combine the free positioning and the auto flow. So you can that every other widget should be auto flow and display one after each other, but only for this area and also for the uh, underlying area, the table, it should stay always on the same position. We see the show table always stay this position. And if you look at the table, so we make the table visible again, and it was, um, it is also stay in the same position as a Zenki chart. So that is what we have defined also in this uh, responsive rules. And the, the widgets that we can also define, certain widgets should be hidden. So now let's have a look into the uh, small phone again. Go to the small phone and you can see that the um, rules is basically cascading down. So if the small phone has should exactly the uh, behavior like a large phone, so I don't need to change anything. So here uh, the rule is cascading down. But in the small phone, because the space is really, really getting small. So actually that does not make sense to switch 
uh, from then each other to the table. So for the small phone, it's already enough if we have can look into the Zenki chart. So with that requirement, and we can just go to um, this uh, hidden widgets area and uh, let's hide this um, show and uh, sh let's then let's hide basically the um, show and the table switch show and table this area. So if we hide it and then this button area is gone and that means for the um, consumer who is consuming the small phone and uh, then they will be only see the Zenki chart, but if they switch to other devices and also the larger phone, they will still be able to switch between chart and also the table. So here it's a very um, powerful responsive rules that based on each devices, you can define rules and or the, this rules is also automatically cascading down. And or if you say your devices is not in the standard list of here, and then you will be able to define your own uh, devices with the width and height and to define your own responsive rules. And also under this rule, we can combine this uh, auto flow with the free positioning. So now you have uh, really a lot of flexibility to define your story once and to enable the best optimized layout for each devices, wherever it is a desktop, uh, desktop monitor or it's a smartphones or tablets. So that's a responsive rule. And with responsive rules, we also supporting the scripting capabilities. You see, I have here a toggle button and a to switch between the table and the chart visibility. Now, and uh, have a look into the further capabilities that we also have the um, um, configurable toolbar. So in the runtime, basically, we will be able to, in the design time, we can configure this uh, runtime toolbar because sometimes the standard toolbar just does not make sense. So in my cases, you see, under the standard toolbar is really a published data, a lot of planning capabilities. That is only because I have a planning data set for my uh, story. So particularly in the runtime, I don't need to uh, publish data and so on. I don't want to confuse my end user with the standard functionality. So I can just remove this um, planning capabilities on here and also the variable prompting. I can also remove it because in my data set, I don't have the um, variable here. Now I would like to um, add the functionality I want to actually use end user to use like a subscribe to data change insight and also for example the share icon so i can just use the um, drag and drop to add the icons to the runtime toolbar and to configure view mode full screen mode or in back mode and if you ac click apply and then the customized toolbar is applied for your story here and also um, in the unified story, we're introducing the new capability like data change inside. So to enable the data change inside, you go to story details to turn on this uh, toggle button. Data change inside is a capability that the SAC can automatically detect the important data changes in your story and then send these data changes via notification and also in, via email in your inbox or display on the SAC home screen. That you as an end user can really get the push notification if something uh, really happens or the data has significant change in your story. So to enable that, you only need to uh, turn on this toggle and uh, then the end user will be able to leverage this capability in the runtime. So no other codings needs to be written here. And if you want to enable the um, <clears throat> data analyzer capability to jump from story to data analyzer, you also only need to turn on this toggle and then this um, end user will be able to navigate in the story runtime from the um, table or chart, go to the data analyzer. So these two are already enabled. And now and, uh, we have you have seen in the design time here, we have the new capability like um, custom widget and we have the um, very powerful responsive layout and or we have the seeming capabilities and we have the runtime toolbar configurations and or we also have the um, 
peer the design time capabilities and also uh, like linked widgets and diagram will show you the whole linked analysis definition in a graphic overview. Now let's go to the runtime to see how this story um, basically working in the runtime. So here first, that's exactly the story what I already configured in the design time. And we can basically here using the um, toggle button to show table and also to here show thank you, now show table, you see? And uh, that's exactly the um, uh, overlapping capability for a um, responsive layout. And you can also using the toggle button to turn on or switch the uh, visibility. And uh, we have also the configurable runtime toolbar that we have the share button. We have this um, um, data change inside the scheduling capabilities here enabled for the runtime. Now let's have a look into this uh, data change inside capability. A story end user now will be able to using the context menu to subscribe data changes. For example, uh, I am interested in the data change of the gross margin. So I can say I'm interested in it and that this gross margin is a high importance for me. And I can also set this um, subscription range because not every data change, small data change, I want to be informed. I only want to be informed if um, big change that is happening. So what is a big change that you can define that individually, basically on your requirements. So we can say the gross margin interested, um, the, uh, as threshold, I want to include this threshold. If the delta value is more than 400,000 euro, then this is an important data change. Then please send me this data changes as uh, email or as notification. So with that, you can go to every chart and now to subscribe the data changes. And uh, for here, the same for the quantity sold by product, we have subscribed as important for the gross margin by product. And we have subscribed as also as a high importance for discount, for example, here, and uh, we have subscribed as normal importance. After you have set basically defined what is interested for you as a data changes, you will be able to using this um, toolbar to trigger the data change inside job. With this data change inside job, you will be able to identify and or basically uh, how frequently this job should be run. It could be run daily, monthly, weekly. And uh, once it is running, it will basically compare the data and uh, between, for example, every morning at eight o'clock, then it will compare the uh, data for the gross margin today morning, eight o'clock with yesterday morning's eight o'clock. And once this gross margin data change has been more than 400,000 euro, and then it will be sent to the end user as a notification or email, etc. So here I, as end user, I can define, I'm interested in the top 10 changes. I'm interested in the different type of the changes. And um, I would like this notification sent to me via email, via mobile app. And of course, if no uh, data change has been happened, then no email should be sent. And then I will be able to see and uh, identify who should be recipients um, would like to um, send to me and also uh, send to my colleague, for example, and uh, select it. And then you click on the create and then basically a data change inside job is already scheduled. And as a result, um, you will be able to get your data changes via notification center here. Click on the notification, then we get the message top six data changing set has been happened. You click on it, then you will be able to see that what is the top six data changes. So you can find that in your notification center in SAC, or in uh, this will be sent as an email to you, or you will be able to see that also in the um, in the SAC and uh, the um, home screen. So now let's have a look into the, maybe let's go to the home screen to here. We go to the home screen. 
then you will be we will be able to see data change inside the tile displayed on your home screen. So to be able to have this data change inside on your home screen, you need to go to your home screen settings to go to home screen settings to turn on data change insights here. Then you will be able to see the data change insights tile here on your home screen. And uh, we will be able to see more details. Click on that. Then you will be exactly to see how this data has been changed. And also, for example, this top five sales manager has been changed. You will be able to see how it has been changed here with more details. You will be able to go to the filter to um, select by time range, importance or subscription type. Or you also will be able to search for a particular data changes. And with this um, um, icon, you will be able to jump to your stories. So here is a central place to display all the important data changes what you're receiving. From here, you will be able to do further navigation. So that's the data change insight capability that uh, we deliver with a unified story. With that, you, we have a kind of monitoring capabilities that you can monitor the most important data changes in this home screen or via notification or in your email inbox, for example, sent as email. Now let's go back to the um, runtime, what we have seen already and uh, in this runtime. And uh, from these uh, stories, we also have the options to uh, jump to navigate to the data analyzer. And uh, you can jump from table or you can jump from the chart. And then now you also have the option to open data analyzer in the current tab or the new tab. If you open in the current tab, it is opening in an overlay of your current story. Means you are still staying in your story environment and the budget the data analyzer now is open and also take over all of the widget state that are, um, basically you have set in your story wherever it is a variable, drill down and so on. You see that is basically the uh, data has been taking over to the table. Now you can using the data analyzer capabilities to do your further data exploration. And uh, after you're finished with the data exploration, you just exit the data analyzer. Then you go back to you are go back to your story again, and uh, it is still the uh, last status of your story. You don't leave your story. Okay, that's a highlight of the unified story. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vivek Verma. I'm the product manager for SAP Analytics Cloud. As part of the Q3 QRC release, I would like to share three innovations we have released uh, in SAC. One is showing or hiding the totals and displaying net totals for stacked bar or column charts. Second is with respect to uh, second and third is with respect to the variance uh, data label and the color configuration. Let's get into the demo. Here we are looking at a higher trend and comparing it with the previous year. Now let's get into the design configuration for the variance panel. So today I have an option to display variance uh, in an integrated format and I can make the data label integrated with the base label, for example. I also have an option to change the color. So I can make positive uh, as green, negative as a bit darker shade of red and null as gray. Next, we will look at the ability to show or hide totals in a stacked bar chart. So here we have a stacked bar chart, which is comparing the employee strength at various career level based on the educational degree. And this is a design time config. So a user can decide whether they want to show the totals or hide the totals. While displaying total, Story Designer also has an option to display or consider the negative values in total. We call it as net totals. So this can be enabled by going into the styling panel, 
enabling net totals you can see that for associate instead of 590 it is showing 545 because it has considered even the positive value and the negative value thank you hello everyone my name is Marwan Farshishi and I am product manager for SAP Analytics Cloud. So today I will present you how you can host and upload your custom widget into SAC. First of all, from the story page, I will direct myself to the custom widget tab. And then with the plus sign, I will be asked to upload my JSON file. First of all, we need to upload the JSON file of our custom widget. So afterwards, we will have a new button and by selecting this button will be able also to upload a zipped folder which contains all our resource file and all our web component file. So afterwards, I press OK. And then I will scroll down to check if my custom widget was uploaded successfully. As you can see here, we uploaded a Seki chart as a custom widget. So now let's go back to the story and let's add this custom widget into, my, into our story. So from the plus, sign under insert custom widget folder, and then I will select my Senki chart into my um, story. So here I will position and I will resize my custom uh, widget. And then from the builder panel, I will be able to select my data source, and then I will bind my custom uh, widget. So now I will open the builder panel from the top uh, bar. And uh, first of all, I will select the beta panel and then I will select my model. And for that, I will use the best run choose model. And I will select as a measure, the net revenue measure. And as a dimension, I will choose the dimension with hierarchy. For example, here I will choose the location and I will change the hierarchy to the level two with including all the parent elements. So here we are. Now we can see our custom widget was added also to my um, story. Hello, my name is Gert Schreffel and I'm a product expert in SAP Analytics Cloud Planning. Today, I want to show you the new commenting support in BW and BPC Live Connections in SAC. This feature enables the use of BW Warehouse-based comments, which are available with BW 750 on HANA and BW 4 HANA, also in the BW and BPC Live Connections. You can use these comments in tables as well as in the comment widget. You can add new comments, edit comments, or delete comments. As the comments are stored in BW, they are also available with other BW frontends, such as the analysis for Office. Let's have a look at the system. Before you can actually use the comments, you have to enable the feature in BW. That means you have to create a so-called document store, which holds the comments, and enable the document support in the query you use in your live connection. Now let's have a look at a story. In this story, we already can see that you have several uh, comments available. Let's create a new comment. So we add a data point comment. So this is a new comment for Austria to your water and we can save the comment as you can see the comment is saved including the username who has created the comment and the timestamp if you want to change the comment you simply press the change button and enter some new data uh, some new text here and press change now, if you want to see how the comment evolved over time, you can have a look at the history. Now, here you can see the first version of the comment, and here you can see the latest version of the comment. If you do not like a comment anymore, you can simply delete it by press delete, and the comment will be deleted, including its history. Instead of using this little triangle, the comment indicator, you can also display the comments as columns, just as with the data point commands on acquired models.
Please note that you can not only comment on normal, say cells at lowest level, but you can also comment on totals or on hierarchy nodes and hierarchy leaves. Besides using the comment widget, you can also use uh, the data point comments, you can also use the comment widget. For the comment widget, you can always have to restrict the comment widget to a single measure in your underlying query. And you can also specify further selections either for the widget itself, or you can use selections that come from other filters, as story filters or page filters. Now let's enter a new comment here for the comment widget. And save it. As you can see here, again, we can see the user and the timestamp. Let's change the comment. In order to see the history. Now we can see again the history. If you do not want to display the history, you can simply disable the history. As well as the details which tell you who were, uh, did create a comment and when. Let's just show the, history, uh, the comments uh, the details again, and let's delete the comment. And again, I can delete the comment. And when the comment is deleted, the entire comment, it's including its history, will be deleted. This is what I wanted to show you. Thanks a lot. With 2023 QRC2, SAP Analytics Cloud introduces a new import API for importing data into models. This is a companion to the export API that we initially shipped last year. And what it does is it offers you a complete programmatic path for uploading data into SAC models. This is for use with tooling such as SAP Data Intelligence or Datasphere. You can use this with third-party data management pipelines. You could build or commission custom uh, connection managers or, or load managers to really create a custom bespoke, uh, essentially connectivity uh, into SAC, or you could even do it manually directly against the APIs using tools such as Postman. It supports open authorization, both two-legged and three-legged, just as the export API does. And the workflow is fairly simple. There is an API endpoint to browse the model catalog. Once you have the ID of the model you are interested in uploading data for, you can create a new low job. So you have API-driven low jobs, just like you have the low jobs that you would manage in the data management tab for the model. And you can create a low job for master data or for fact data. You would configure the mapping as well uh, with this, so with this endpoint. Then you would use another data endpoint and you would push data up into the model, either into the master data or to the fact data but it's not yet actually committed to the model. You can perform a validation first to double check that the data you have uploaded is in fact valid and you would get feedback on that. And then once everything is looking good, you can execute the load job. This gives you essentially all the main features of the data management tab import management minus the Wrangler, of course, uh, but you can manage this entirely programmatically and, and how you like. Here we are looking in Postman, we'll have a look at a couple of the API endpoints. So we'll look at the catalog and you can see here, I can see my tenant, I can see API version one, the new data import uh, segment section for, for endpoints. And then this is the models endpoint. And I had just executed this a moment ago, and now you can see the entire catalog of models for this particular tenant. If I were to go and look into one particular model, let's pick one of the National Parks model, I can see here that on the import API, I have three end, I have three endpoints. I have a fact data endpoint, a master data endpoint, and a master fact data endpoint.
And from here, I can then create new low jobs. I can browse those low jobs, et cetera, et cetera, push data up, validate the data and, and commit it. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Godfrey, and I'm one of the product managers with SAP Analytics Cloud. I focus on planning. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through a few of the items we have coming as part of our Q2 2023 QRC release in the planning area. And we're gonna start in the area of data actions with the ability to modify the underlying model reference within a data action. So now when you have a data action, you can actually repoint the data action to a different underlying model, right? And when you do that, this then allows you to retroactively change the data action based on the structure of the new model. So you'll get a notification or notifications of different areas within the data action that need to be addressed specifically. But what is nice about this model substitution is that there's no limitations on the structure of the original default model and the newly selected default model. So if you wanted to point an existing account model data action to a new model, you could do that and vice versa. So let's jump over and see this in action. So if you just look at the data action designer here, I have the seed forecast data action. I have the ability to actually repoint or reset the default model. We won't do that right now. We'll just look at the models first before we do that, right? So let's jump over and look at the, the original model, the source model, which is this XPA security. It has four base measures with currency enabled. It also has a role project dimension down here. And when we compare that to the model we're gonna use and we're gonna substitute, uh, that only has one measure that measures amount and it doesn't have this role project dimension either. Okay. So if we look at the data action designer again, if I look at the specific copy step, what I'm expecting to see is an error here with this measures because I don't have a quantity measure in my new target model. So I can now select the new default model once I do that, it'll just take a second to process as it's sort of validating. You'll see now I've got an error. When I select a step, yes, it's notified me that in fact this quantity measure is a problem. I need to edit the measure, select the amount. And now I click save and everything's good and it's now repointed to the new model. Oh, my name is Derek Johnson. I'm a product expert for SAC. In this enhancement, we're going to look at how we can integrate the allocation design time directly into the data action framework to make our planners more efficient in creating their allocations and embedding that into complex workflows. Now let's take a look at an example in the system. So in this example, we're going to be allocating our marketing spend to our plan. So the first thing we've done is we've created a Data action are started to, to copy our actuals into plan from 2022 to 2023. So you can see this copy. And then we've also assigned a marketing budget here, which we'll be allocating to our accessories line. So let's take a look at how we can take advantage of the new data action capabilities that embeds allocations directly within the data action and allows us to both create and edit it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add our allocation step. Uh, note if we wanted to use an existing allocation step, uh, they're available to us, uh, you know, after this enhancement as well. We would simply select this button and then we could select their allocation step that we may have previously created. In this case, we're going to give our allocation a name. And then we're going to do the design of this allocation directly within the data action. So this is what's new. So we're going to add a few filters here just to uh, streamline its execution. So we've selected our marketing and our 22, 23 calendar year, and then we're going to uh, assign a booking account. So this is all uh, capabilities that we currently have within the, defining the allocation steps. Uh, we can also overwrite the target. And if we want to create complex rules here, uh, we can do that. We can you know, easily expand the number of dimensions used in the source, driver, and target dimensions. And you can see that we can expand them for each of these. 
So in this scenario, we're going to keep it pretty simple, and we're going to be allocating our marketing spend based on what's in the unassigned account, and then we will take a look at our, we'll be doing our revenue as a driver, And lastly, we're going to assign this to a particular product group. So you notice that for our product here, we're using product H1 for our first hierarchy, and we're using a different hierarchy uh, for this activity. And here we're going to assign that to the accessories group. So when we're happy with the rules, we can save them here. Like I said, we can also copy rules if we'd like. If we want to copy the rules, uh, we could simply do copy and paste. So here you can see this as well. Uh, similarly, if we wanted to copy these and move that back into our design, we could then use the paste activity to add different rules in here as well that we may be maintaining externally. So we've saved our allocation rule as part of our data action, and then we'll execute it. And here we're going to see that we're going to allocate this marketing expense to the accessories line, which you can see here. So the key advantage here with this enhancement, in my mind, is that we can uh, directly create these allocation steps within the data actions. We can start embedding them into complex processes. And if we need to make changes to our rules, they're very simple to do that all within one place, the data action framework. Thank you. So with this release, we're introducing a data action monitor administration privilege. This is a specific right that can be granted to any role. Uh, of course, this will be default enabled for any uh, planning administrators. They had access before to see the entire run history and to cancel existing jobs within the data action monitor. But now this right can be granted to any other role. It can either be granted in read form, which would allow them to see the entire run history, or manage form, which would allow them to actually cancel existing running jobs. Right? So it's often the case that you do want to grant some other users the ability to see run history in the data action monitor so they can understand what's going on. Up until this point, only the planning administrator had that right, and any other user would see only their own run history. So let's jump over and see this in action. OK, if I just pivot over to my data action monitor, you'll see this user Lester has executed one data action. I'm going to go ahead and navigate over to my roles now. And Lester belongs to this role PR2. And for this PR2, if I scroll down in the role, you'll see that I have a new privilege that I can grant. That privilege is the Data Action Monitor Administration. I'll go ahead and grant the read access to that. And I'll save the role. Now, if I granted Manage as well, I'd have the ability to cancel the executing data actions. I'm not going to do that here. Once this save is complete, I'll go ahead and navigate back over to my data action monitor. I'll do a quick refresh here so that the right applies. And what I'll see now is all the data actions that have been run in this tenant. Now, that doesn't mean I have access to all of them. You'll see some of them are sort of grayed out. But I can see the run history for all of them and the details. So this is the data action monitor administration privilege that can be granted with our Q2 2023 QRC release. So with the Q2 release, we're introducing a dedicated data locking step type within multi-actions. So when you select this step type, of course, you can define the lock state for that given step. That can either be open, restricted, or locked. The step, will, of course, will accept parameters, and you can pass various dimension elements to the locks. And you have the ability to define as many lock steps as you want in a given multi-action. So you might want to, for example, unlock the data in the first step, run a second step that processes some changes using a data action. Third step may relock the data. Or perhaps within a single multi-action, you want to lock data across multiple models. You could do that with this capability. So let's jump over and see this in action. So now in the multi-action designer, you'll see I have a new toolbar item for data locking step. In this particular multi-action, I have three steps. The first step will unlock my forecast version. The second step will seed my actuals version 
into my forecast, so actual periods in the actual version into my forecast. And third step, I'll lock Q1 in my forecast version. So if we jump over to the story, you'll see that I have actuals and forecast versions on my report. Uh, actuals has Q1 populated, forecast currently has no data. I go ahead and run my multi-action. What I expect to see is the Q1 numbers from the actuals copied to the forecast Q1, and then I expect to see my forecast locked. And yes, that's what I see. It's locked for Q1, but it's still available for the rest of the year. So if I want to make a change, for example, in Q2, I can go ahead and do that. There's no problem with that. So let's illustrate the process again. And let's assume in this case that I've got new or updated actuals um, and I want to reseed my forecast. So I'll go ahead and make a change to my Q1 actuals. And I'm going to rerun my multi-action. Right? So the first step of the multi-action when I run it will be to unlock the forecast version to allow the updated values to be seeded. I will go ahead and run that. And what I see now is that, yes, in fact, my updated actuals have been copied in the forecast and Q1 is again locked. So this is the data locking step type available for multi-actions with our Q2 release. Hello, my name is Derek Johnson. I'm a product manager for SAC. This session, we're going to be looking at how we've integrated data actions and multi-actions into the file repository. So let's take a look in the system. So what we're looking at is the data actions repository. This is what the repository that previously contained all of your data actions. And now what you're going to see is the most recent data actions. In a similar fashion, if you'd like to create your data action here, you could do that directly via the button. One of the improvements that we've made is that we've allowed the integration of data actions within the file repository. And this makes it very easy to organize your, your various data actions that you create. The thing that you need to be aware of is that uh, once this enhancement comes into play, uh, they will be put into a certain location under the public folder. It'll be under data actions as well as multi-actions. And we'll take a look at the default file folder here. Note that we have, in this case, uh, several users have created uh, their own folders for data actions, and this is perfectly okay. So just understand where the uh, default location is, and if you'd like to change how you organize your data actions or multi-actions, uh, you can certainly do that. So now we're going to look at where the multi-actions are stored, and this is very similar as well. It'll be under uh, My Files in Public, and you'll see the multi-actions. In this case, there's really not that many multi-actions that have been created in the system. But in a similar way, you could have multiple folders as well. If you'd like to, you could also organize your data actions and multi-actions within a workspace, which we're showing here. So this makes it very easy for project-type work, where you need a limited number of team to uh, access data action. You can do that during development. And certainly, you could roll out the workspaces as well as part of your deployment strategy. Just know that you can uh, very easily organize that because you can create your file structures in which to uh, organize your content. With this enhancement, you also need to assign folder permissions. And this is very similar to the other folder permissions we have. And this really allows the user to access a particular data action. And you can do that you know, by uh, data action or multi-action or at the folder level as well. And this is required for execution. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the user in this scenario will also need to have role-based security, which allows them to run data actions and multi-actions as well. So uh, the role-based security is kind of that overarching what can they do, and the folder security is the more specific of what specific data actions and multi-actions you can create, you can execute. So within the file structure, you can create data actions directly, which we're showing here. And, uh, and we can also uh, start to filter on data actions, multi-actions as well. So this makes it easier to, uh, if you have your objects commingled, uh, you can take a look at that all in one spot. So take a look at the new uh, enhancement here. I think it'll make it easier to manage your data actions going forward. So thank you. And that's it with this enhancement.
So with the Q2 release, we're making some enhancements to the calendar, and specifically the Gantt view, where we're now visually representing dependencies. So if you have existing dependencies between two steps, two tasks or processes, you'll see an arrow linking those two uh, components that will define the dependency. You have the ability to double click and change the existing dependency. And you can also drag and drop to create new dependencies between given tasks or processes. So this ability to render and create new dependencies in the Gantt chart makes dependency management a little more intuitive. So let's jump over and see this in action. So if I look at my calendar, I have two processes here, an annual plan and a Q2 forecast. Under my annual plan, I have a second step that is my lock annual plan. Now that lock annual plan is started based on dependency to the annual plan America step. But of course, that's difficult to represent or to understand here in the list view. But now when I pull up the Gantt view, I'll see between those two steps an arrow that will define the dependency. I can double click on that arrow if I want to make changes to the existing dependencies. And uh, in addition to that, you'll see that I have a third step here with my archive annual plan. And that step itself is dependent on the lock annual plan. And there's a, a linkage and an arrow between those two. Now with my Q2 forecast, I have three tasks or three tasks and processes. That's the managed manage forecast drivers, my Q2 revenue forecast and my Q2 expenses. I'm gonna go ahead and create new dependencies between those. So I'm gonna take my manage forecast drivers, which will be my preliminary step. I'm gonna drag that to the forecast revenue and I'm going to define the start criteria conditions for this. That will now create a new arrow defining the dependencies and setting up a start condition between those two. And I can take that one step further and I can make my expense forecast itself dependent on completion of the revenue forecast. I can make slightly different start conditions here, maybe only partially successful or fully successful. And when I do that, I'll have created a secondary condition or dependency between my revenue forecast and my expense forecast. Okay, so this is the visual dependencies in the calendar list view as part of our Q2 release. With this release, we're introducing some new capabilities to the mass data entry mode. So now when you go into mass data entry mode, you have the ability to actually add new members while in MDE. So you can insert the members for, for new unbooked combinations, and you can go ahead and plan the data against those combinations before you exit or process the data. So let's jump over and see this enhancement in action. So I have my table. I'm gonna go ahead and enable mass data entry mode. And once I've done that, I can now right click on the member and I can select add member that's now available. Of course, I can start typing and I'll see a list of the possible or members that I can insert. And when I do that, right after I do that, I can still go ahead and key in my values, right? So I can do the add member and the data updates without having processed or exited the mass data entry mode. So I make those changes, I click the process and the whole operation, inclusion of the new member and the updates taken one update. Hello, my name is Derek Johnson. I'm a product manager for SAC. In this enhancement, we're going to be looking at some of the improvements we've made to managing versions within the story. The first enhancement is related to being able to simply create a blank version of the story, which is useful for planning scenarios. In addition to that, we have a toggle, which allows you to see the active and inactive versions related to a table. So let's take a look at these enhancements in the system. So we're going to open up the version management panel, and what we're going to see is that the toggle is selected for versions, so we only see those versions that are active within the table. But if we want to see all versions, we can deselect this toggle, and we can see all versions that we have access to within the model. So this makes it very easy to view both the active versions as well as all versions when performing activities within version management. We can also simply create a blank version as well. And this is a one-step process where we can create our blank version and assign it a category, which is often the basis for starting a new planning scenario. 
So take a look at these enhancements as they make planning even easier. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jeanne Bigonnet and I'm here to share with you exciting news about latest deliveries in Microsoft Office integration part. Let's have a look. First of all, uh, we will release a new set of uh, custom functions and with this custom function it will be possible directly to define the data action parameters directly in the grid. The idea here is really to provide flexibility for the end user because then he will be able to directly set his parameter from in Excel grid. Secondly, we have also added the capability for numeric parameters to define reference in the grid itself. Then changing the number in the grid will be uh, changing the parameter from, for the data action. Let's see a demo of this feature. So you see that I have uh, implemented one data action in my grid and then I will use a new formula, first of all, to retrieve the name of this data action. So with this first formula, I can retrieve the name. With the second formula, I can retrieve the parameters of this data action. So you see it, subget planning trigger parameters. And of course, I have to precise the name of the data action. And then I'm retrieving all the parameters in the sheet here that you also see in the builder pane on the right hand side. Then I will also implement the next function to be able to directly set the parameters of this uh, data action. First parameter, of course, it's the name of the data action. The second is the first uh, parameter to define. I can also define uh, if I want to see the parameters and the members uh, on the ID and description or only description. I can also change the order. So here I will uh, see it uh, now differently and you can see that uh, the target version is actual. We see it in the, directly in the sheet here, but also in the panel. And clicking on the, on the pencil, I can directly change this reference to a budget. And this is automatically, of course, also applied on the uh, Builder pane on the right hand side. There will be also an improvement for numeric parameters where it will be then possible not only to enter manually data, but also to point to an Excel cell as a reference. Then in my example here, as soon as you change the cell, the content of the cell D13, then automatically the parameter for effect will be also changed in the data action. That was for the demo part. With QRC2, we introduced the capability to refresh data at workbook opening. We have already introduced to customer this new capability to define if a workbook has to be refreshed manually or automatically. This capability is introduced in the workbook preference, a new menu on the ribbon, uh, which is accessible to the end user to define his preference. This concludes the presentation of the latest delivery in QRC2 for the Microsoft integration part. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, in Q2 2023, we have some exciting releases for SAP Analytics Cloud mobile application. First, we have the unified story experience on mobile. That is with the third phase of improvements for the analytic application integration with optimized story experience, you can now leverage these new and improved functionalities on your mobile device. You can now create a new responsive layout story using the new responsive reflow design with basic story features such as overlap widgets and set responsive rules specifically for your mobile devices and set widget positions, size and visibility. You can now also access content that is created using a canvas layout on your mobile devices. With the unified story experience, we have improved mobile previews so that now you can with more accuracy visualize how your story is going to appear on different device sizes. 
any story that is created using advanced features such as scripting, custom widgets and themes will now also be available to be viewed on your mobile application. And lastly, you can now view content created using this new experience on the Safari browser. This is how a story that is created using Unified Story Experience looks on the mobile application by default. So if you use a responsive layout, it will automatically be adjusted to be viewed on your mobile devices. But let's say you want to customize how your widgets appear on your mobile device. For instance, I would want my four KPIs, gross margin, quantity sold, discount, and net revenue to not occupy the entire grid space. And I want to view four of these KPIs together in the same grid. So in this case, I'm going to divide the grid space by four and have all these four KPIs take up 25% of the grid space. And lastly, I'm going to assign the border the entire grid space. And once you save this setting, this is how it is going to appear on your mobile device. In this way, you can go to any device that you want and set the responsive rule configurations according to how you want them to appear on that particular mobile device. And lastly, any story created using Unified Story Experience can now be shared using a link and can be viewed directly on the Safari browser without having to download the mobile application. As part of the Q2 2023 releases for mobile analytics, we have the mobile browser authentication using app configurations. For security reasons, a customer might have a strict requirement to be able to use their MDM provisioned browser for app authentication to SAP Analytics Cloud. Today, changes to the default browser settings can only be made on an SDK level. However, with this release, customers can easily change their default browser to their MDM provisioned browser using the MDM app configuration settings by pushing a key value pair. Today, the default browser is Safari controller. However, from this release, we provide you the key value pair to switch the default browser for AirWatch and Intune. So you simply go to the application configuration and click the edit button and enter the key value type and the configuration value. So here we have the configuration key that is authentication URL scheme. And next we will add the value type as string. And for instance, I want to configure it for workspace one browser. So my configuration value was AWBS. And now that you publish it with this settings, Now, when you install the application from the MDM, the first time login, you will have to set up an app password, then connect to the tenant that you want to use to access your stories. And now for the authentication, it will use Workspace ONE as the browser for authentication. With the Q2 2023 release, we also support for the analytics catalog on the Android mobile application. This was already available to our iOS users. However, with this release, our Android users can also leverage the analytics catalog tab from our mobile application. So with this release, you can access any and every mobile enabled content that is published to the catalog. So you can do the publishing using the SAP Analytics Cloud web application. And once it is published to the catalog, you can also access all the files that are available and are mobile enabled on the catalog tab in the mobile application. This is how the catalog appears on your mobile application. You can use the search bar to directly search for the files that are already published to the analytics catalog. You can also just click a particular analytics catalog item to get to see all the files that are available within it. Thanks for watching. Hopefully our demos have helped you leverage the latest features in SAP Analytics Cloud in your organization. Remember to leave a like on this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with everything Analytics Cloud. 
We are excited for what's to come in 2023, so stay tuned and we'll see you next time.